Good morning, everybody. This is another edition of the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com, by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. A little bit of a filibuster today as we always get into what's going on in the world of baseball sports and unifying America. We did a show last week. We talked a little bit about the life and the impact of Tom Seaver. And a couple days later, of course, we lost another Baseball Hall of Famer. Um, as it relates to the top 100 offensive position players of all time, I have Lou Brock ranked number 122, which is nothing to be ashamed of. He had a great career, obviously the all-time stolen base leader for a short period of time, the end of his baseball career, and then up until Ricky Henderson broke his record. And really, you look back at a guy that probably was a little bit underrated. I think he had a, a strong career. It was solid. I thought that he was a very integral part, especially of the Cardinals teams that won the World Series in 1964 and 1967. Keith Hernandez always refers to the fact that he was such a big leader, a very quiet but passionate ball player that was, was compared to Bob Gibson in regards to his intensity in the clubhouse of the St. Louis Cardinals, but wasn't looked at like Bob Gibson in some cases. You know, Gibson was looked at as very curt, very tough. Um, Brock had to, those same type of qualities, but kept them kind of under the wrap. And he was able to express himself in very important situations as a leader. And you look back at, of course, Lou Brock. And one of the first things you, you, you hear or you think of when Lou Brock comes to mind is the guy's you know, ability to steal bases, the all-time stolen base leader between Ty Cobb and Ricky Henderson. Broke the record, of course, in the late 1970s. But then you think of the trade that was made between the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals in 1964, which turned out to be the turning point in Lou, Lou Brock you know, becoming a star player, but also the St. Louis Cardinals coming back in the 1964 pennant race, beating the Philadelphia Phillies in what was the biggest collapse of all time in the history of Major League Baseball up until the New York Mets of 2007. And the one story that doesn't get told is why that trade was made. And it's unfortunate because, you know, we continue in a day and age that we live in right now, try to hide racism that has impacted us and really should be at the forefront of what we try to remember when we're looking at things that have happened before. And we won't want to tell stories that make us look bad and make white people look to be any worse than they're perceived. And unfortunately, we've come a long way to get to society where we are right now in 2020. And some may disagree, but I believe we have made some significant progress. Like I said, Black Lives Matter is not just the majority of black people unifying. There is a significant amount of white influence in Black Lives Matter, which is the most progress we've ever made in society up to this point. But Lou Brock was traded from the Chicago Cubs to the St. Louis Cardinals, and not just because the Cubs wanted a veteran starting pitcher, which they got. Ernie Broglio was a very defined starting pitcher at that time, was very good, was one of the better consistent starting pitchers in the National League at that time. He wasn't an ace, he wasn't you know, one of the best in the league at that time, but he was good. He was a solid, formidable starting pitcher, and the Chicago Cubs making, making that trade improved themselves on a starting pitching front. And of course, Lou Brock, who ends up becoming a Hall of Famer later on, it, it turns out to be a very bad trade, but there were some extenuating circumstances with that. The Cubs owner, Philip Wrigley at the time, is getting a lot of heat from season ticket holders that are mad. Not mad because the Cubs haven't won a World Series since 1908 and haven't been to the World Series since 1945, but fans and season ticket holders are writing the owner claiming that the Cubs are getting too black. The face of their franchise is Ernie Banks. They got a young outfielder by the name of Billy Williams. 
Buck O'Neill, the first black head coach, um, coach on a coaching staff in Major League Baseball history, is part of the Chicago Cubs at that time. Fergie Jenkins. You know, you think of the amount of black players on a Cubs team, and it was really no different than what the Dodgers were doing. It was nothing different than what the Giants are doing in a majority of Major League Baseball. Every single team to that point in 1964 had been integrated. There wasn't a single team. You know, the Red Sox were the last in 1957 with Pumpsy Green. So every team to that point had had at least a black or a handful of black players that had played for their team. So just to talk about where we are in 1964, and we know with the civil rights movement and Jackie Robinson kind of leading it, you got Martin Luther King, and some progress is being made, but not enough. And obviously there's a lot of, you know, almost, you know, you look at people that still just aren't, don't want to see it. They don't want to see blacks in the same light as whites. And this is 1964, this isn't 1947. So you got fans and season ticket holders that are writing the Cubs owner threatening to not renew their season tickets if they don't do anything about the amount of black players that are on that team. And the one thing that isn't spoken about enough is one of the reasons that Lou Brock was traded from the Cubs to the Cardinals had to do with race, had to do with the owner coming down saying we have too many black players on this team. And it's unfortunate. And you look at Brock and the career that he had, and you know the Cubs pretty much knew how good of a player he was. It's not like this is some unknown talent that the Cardinals swooped in and snagged. You know, it's not like the Cubs were saying, "Hey, we want Ernie Broglio," and the Cardinals were like, "Hey, how about this guy Lou Brock that you don't know anything about?" The Cubs knew just how good Lou Brock was. And unfortunately. Race played a major role in it and a, and a major enough role that isn't spoken about to this day. And it was brought up again. You know, a couple stories were put out about the Lou Brock trade and the inside aspect of it. And part of the reason that he was traded from the Cubs to the Cardinals. And I'm glad, you know, it was brought to the forefront. Of course, we remember Lou Brock as a Hall of Famer, over 3,000 hits. And, you know, I think at the surface, you look at him, the one-time, all-time stolen base leader, as I mentioned before, 3,000 hits. You say, all right, he's a Hall of Famer. But you don't ever look at Lou Brock and say he was one of the best in the game. And unfortunately, a lot of it had to do with the era that he played in. He played, you know, the majority of his career in the shadows of guys like Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. You know, Frank Robinson was, you know, an excellent player. And like I said, we talk about, and I've talked about on this show, about how underrated Frank Robinson was as a Major League Baseball player. He was one of the best to ever play. But he kind of goes in the shadows of Aaron and of Mays because maybe he wasn't exactly that good or as good as they were. But if you put him at any other point in baseball history, he would have been the best player in the game, hands down. And Lou Brock kind of goes back. It's not quite Willie McCovey. It's not quite Willie Stargell or Billy Williams. You know, he's not quite Harmon Killebrew. He's a good player. A very good player. But unfortunately, he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. And, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't mention again the reason that he was traded from the Cubs to the Cardinals. I understand that you know, Ernie Broglio, for the majority of his career, takes a lot of heat and the rest of his life for being on the wrong side of that trade. That wasn't his fault. All he was was a pitcher that you know may have not had as much left to offer. He helped the Cubs for a little bit, but it's not like he had another decade in him. But he ends up being the butt to that trade when you talk about in the history of Major League Baseball, the worst trades that were made in the history. You, know, you think of the Bartolo Colon trade by Omar Minaya coming from the Indians to the Montreal Expos. You could talk about the Robinson Cano, Edwin Diaz trade by Brody Van Wagen in a couple off seasons ago between the Mets and the Seattle Mariners. And I think we'll find out over the course of history where that trade ends up ranking. But when you think of, hey, the worst trades made of all time, yeah, there's the Bartolo Colon trade, there's the Lou Brock trade. You know, you could also think of a couple other ones. Ryan Sandberg going from the Phillies to the Cubs. 
another trade from the, with, involving the Phillies and the Cubs with this pitcher by the name of Fergie Jenkins for Larry Jackson. That didn't work out too well for the Phillies. But Lou Brock, you know, outside of being a Hall of Famer, outside of 3,000 hits, all-time stolen base leader at one point, is known for being in, involved in one of the worst trades in baseball history. But once again, we don't talk enough about why that trade was made. Cubs weren't trading early Ernie Banks. They weren't trading Billy Williams. They weren't going to fire Buck O'Neill, who at that point was the first and for a little while was the only black coach in Major League Baseball at that time. Lou Brock, outside of the Cubs, who probably knew he was a pretty good player, Major League Baseball didn't know a ton about Lou Brock. So it was the safest move for them to make. And Philip Wrigley ends up getting a couple more season ticket sales or ends up losing or not losing a couple more season ticket holders by trading Lou Brock. But I think it has to be acknowledged that what had happened. And the fact that racism was still very prevalent at that time in 1964 remains that to this day. This copyright and broadcast is authorized under internet rights granted by the World Wide Web and is solely for entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, other use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this show without the express written consent of the past ball show, JohnPielli.com and JohnPielli LLC is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of the program, such as by charging, admission for a showing is similarly prohibited. So if you look at the different camera angle, maybe it's a little bit of a better view. I don't know. Send feedback, JRPLE at gmail.com. You could comment on the YouTube video call the show if you want if you're listening live number 732-364-3598 so there there is a very strong contingent of baseball fans that are advocating for Roberto Clemente to get a little more respect in baseball maybe you take the number 21 you retire it throughout baseball and I don't think it's a bad opinion to have I just don't think it's 100% accurate you're looking at Roberto Clemente when you think of Puerto Rico, the part of the United States that is, as it is, even though it kind of is its own, the equivalent to its own country, its own region. You think of Puerto Rican stars, and Roberto Clemente really was the first star Puerto Rican player when it comes to the history of Major League Baseball. And he helped transform the game. You know, there was many throughout, you know, the Latin American countries that look at Clemente for what he did. But the reason that he stands out is he was as great of a baseball player as he was. But he wasn't the first Puerto Rican player to play in Major League Baseball history. So a lot of people equate or want to equate Roberto Clemente to the likes of Jackie Robinson. And even though he had a similar impact to what Jackie Robinson had on fellow black players, as Roberto Clemente did with many Puerto Rican players, but also many... Uh, Spanish and Hispanic players, Spanish-speaking players, as they played over the course of Major League Baseball history, he had that type of impact, but didn't have the distinction of being the first. And the first was Hiram Bithorn, a pitcher in the 1930s. He ended up living a short life. It was unfortunate. He ends up getting killed, you know, still in a, what was the equivalent of the prime of his life, similar to Clemente. Clemente, of course, dying in the, the plane accident, the tragic accident, delivering supri supplies to Nicaragua on New Year's Eve of 1972. And it's a little bit of a similar story, not so much of what happened. He ends up getting killed. Hiram Bithorn was murdered. And there's a stadium out in Puerto Rico called Hiram Bithorn Stadium, acknowledging him for his significance in the history of not only Puerto Rican-born Major League Baseball players, but Spanish-speaking baseball players in a history that we've seen since. And many Hispanic players look at Hiram Bithorn for the credit and give him the credit that he deserves, but don't give him more credit than Roberto Clemente. And I think the reason Roberto Clemente gets so much respect is because he was one of the best players that baseball has ever had. He had a career that was much better than Hiram Bithorn. And I make this you know, point for a reason, because we think about Jackie Robinson and his impact 
on Major League Baseball and its history. It helped that Jackie Robinson you know, won the Rookie of the Year in 1947. It helped that Jackie Robinson eventually won an MVP in the National League. It helped that Jackie Robinson, by the time his career was done, it was understood that he was going to make the Baseball Hall of Fame based off of the merits of how good of a baseball player he was. But let me throw this hypothetical in there. What if he was not that good? Or what if his accomplishments on the baseball field were not anywhere near what he ended up doing over the course of the 10 years that he played? Because you think of Larry Doby, and Larry Doby in his first year in 1947 with the Cleveland Indians didn't make a great impression. In fact, he probably had to deal with uh, racism a little bit to the nth degree, even worse than Jackie Robinson. And I know Jackie Robinson didn't have it easy, but Larry Doby had it worse because he didn't necessarily get the approval of the majority of his team. You, know, you talk about the Dixie Walkers and the Kirby Higbees of the 1947 Dodgers, and they, they existed. You know, the, you think of the likes of Bobby Bragan and Carl Farilla, who over time kind of changed their point of view, and eventually Dixie Walkers won over, Kirby Higbees traded, and all of a sudden the Dodgers go on their merry way, and the majority of, if not all, the Dodger players by the end of the 1947 season respect Jackie Robinson as one of their own. Same thing didn't happen with Larry Doby and the Cleveland Indians. And you think of another player that made his debut in 1947, Hank Thompson, who at the time was playing for the St. Louis Browns, who are now the, the Baltimore Orioles. He lasted a couple months, was released, went back to the Negro Leagues, ends up playing for the Giants in the late 40s and the 1950s, ends up being a mentor to Willie Mays and to Monty Irvin ends up having a pretty good career. Unfortunately, later on in his life or during his life, he ends up getting into some problems with the law, has to serve some time in prison for a couple robberies that he commits. But I digress. Talking about the impact of a player once they're breaking a barrier and the possibility that maybe maybe Jackie Robinson, and he did, did deal, certainly, him and Rachel dealt with their struggles. But what if Jackie Robinson didn't back it up with the type of play that he had? Because he had a great 1947 season. Maybe not the best start, but by the end of the 1947 season was one of the considered one of the best players on that Brooklyn Dodgers team. So as I compare it to Hiram Bithorn, he blazed a trail, certainly, but didn't have the backing of his maybe baseball card or baseball reference page, however you want to look at it. And I think Roberto Clemente, as he emerged as really the first Latin American star in Major League Baseball history, kind of stole a lot of his th thunder. Now, it doesn't mean that Roberto Clemente wasn't an all-time great. It doesn't mean that he deserves the credit that he gets for being a trailblazer and dealing with some things that weren't right. I mean, the fact that you know the general public wanted him to change his name from Roberto to Bobby and put you know, his name, hey, this is Bobby Clemente because Roberto sounds too Spanish. That's obviously a form of racism if you don't get it. I mean, the guy's name is Roberto. You're going to make him change his name because it doesn't fit into your you know, your American narrative, your white Anglo-Saxon narrative, he obviously dealt with trouble. And, you know, he, he conquered it. He had a great baseball clear, career. We know his last hit was number 3,000 on the last game or last day of the 1972 season. But you look at it, are we not giving Hiram Bithorn enough credit? And that's my question. Like, there's no, nothing wrong with giving Roberto Clemente all the credit that he gets. You're going to retire his number throughout baseball? Hey, you want to do that? I don't have a problem with it. I'm kind of ambivalent on it. I really am. You know, I don't think he had the impact that Jackie Robinson had. That's my opinion. But if you retire it across baseball, I don't have a problem with it. To me, there was no Hiram Bithorn 
for Jackie Robinson. Or if you want to make the comparison, say, where's uh, William Edward White? Where is, you know, the likes of Moses Fleawood Walker? You know, those names are known, but aren't known as the Trailblazers because of the amount of time that went by after they were done playing till Jackie Robinson made his Major League debut on April 15, 1947. But maybe, and if you want to take a counter take kind of at me, you could say that, you know, Bithorn maybe is the equivalent of a William Edward White or a Moses Fleawood Walker. Possibly. But I think Hiram Bithorn being the first in what becomes a series of Latin players. Now, Roberto Clemente, like I said, he was the first star. And that's why he gets the credit that he does. But I think we should spend a little more time talking about the significance of Hiram Bithorn and you know him coming into baseball and integrating baseball in a way for Latin players that Jackie Robinson eventually did for black players. And it doesn't mean any of it that was going on there was right. Baseball was a white game for the longest time and shouldn't have been. So next thing I want to get into, we're talking about, and if you go to johnpielli.com, you'll see the first black managers in Major League Baseball history. You'll see the first black head coaches in the history of the National Football League. And one of the things that, the points that I made is the fact that baseball still, every team hasn't had a black manager. In a National Football League, we're talking about about 70% of its players are black. You're still talking about nine teams that have still never had a black head coach. National Basketball Association, we're talking about probably 85%, maybe a little less, maybe a little more of its players are black. They've had no problem making sure that every team has had at least one black head coach. And it's up there if you want to look at it at johnpielli.com, the first black head coach for every team in the National Basketball Association. And the reason I put that up there is kind of a call out to football and another call out to baseball. And I'm, I don't know if there's enough pressure from the general public. I don't think there's enough pressure from the media for these teams to do a little more consideration when they have a head coaching or managerial vacancy in their sports. Because I still think in the year of 2020, we don't have a problem with a black person becoming part of our military and fighting for and giving his life for our country. We don't have a problem with a black player playing any one of our professional sports, which includes hockey. Hockey has made some progress, but it's still a predominantly white sport. But I don't hear enough pressure or backlash from the general public or the media for Major League Baseball teams and NFL teams to just all have had a black head coach at some point in their, their times. I mean, the Pittsburgh Steelers were known as probably the most white-run franchises in the history of sports. Interviewed Mike Tomlin, he blew him away, and now have a pro football head coach that is probably going into the Hall of Fame when he's done. Remember the Patriots, the Giants? You're looking back at the Rams in their history that dates back to 1935, the Giants from the 1920s. What's wrong with having a little bit of a, a public disturbance over the fact that they have never hired a black head coach? The New York Yankees, the Philadelphia Phillies, the Boston Red Sox. How come there's no pressure coming from the general public asking those teams and their front offices and their ownerships why they've never hired a black major league manager? You know, and you hear about you know the Al Campanis comments that he made in 19, what was it, 1987? The 40 year anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in Major League Baseball. And he did a bad job. He should have thought a little bit better before he said what he said. But I, I think for that time frame, he was saying something that there were still a lot of people that agreed with at that time. And you see it as it happens today. 
you know, blacks who are just as qualified as whites to do anything are not given the opportunity to run sports teams. Some of them are, but nowhere near the amount that should be. And the fact that you have a baseball manager, which has basically been castrated, his job is just to implement a game plan. How come there's 11 teams in Major League Baseball that have never hired a black manager? I think it's an indictment on those teams. And I hope at some point we move on and you know look back when it comes to baseball teams. Like I said, the original 16 Major League Baseball teams went from 1947 to 1957 within 10 years, made sure they all had at least one black player that played in the Major Leagues. And I know the Yankees were the second to last and the Red Sox were the last. And they got a little heat for it, but they did it. And now neither one of those teams have had any issues since. You know, they've had their share of black players play for them. But when Frank Robinson became the first African-American manager in Major League Baseball history in 1975, how come there wasn't that same call? How come there wasn't that same declaration of, all right, you know what, in the 1980s and in the 1990s, at the very least, 20 years later, talking 1995, I think all teams in Major League Baseball could say, hey, we could have at least hired one black manager by then. Now you're talking about another 25 years added on to it. We're talking about 45 years since their first black manager was hired in Major League Baseball history, and 11 teams have still never hired a manager of color. Last thing we're going to talk about, you think about Sirius XM and internet radio, whether you're talking about YouTube, one of the things that have kind of been normalized is the use of profane language or profanities or curse words as they're put into really any type of discussion. You look up a video and there's odds are there's going to be some sort of profanity in it the censorship that exists. You know, you think of FCC regulations as they, uh, you know, reigned along radio and TV for years upon years. You know, you think of Sirius XM and cable television, which have kind of taken those guidelines and said, you know what, they're not necessarily that important anymore. And I was thinking about it. You know, can I draw more attention to myself if I used more profanities? But if I did, I, I don't think I would be my true self. And I and one of the things that I've always wanted to do on this show is be the person that I am, express the opinions that I have. And you think of let's say a Pat McAfee who's now on Mad Dog Sports Radio brought, you know, the F bomb to to that you know, station on the network. And that could be your cup of tea. It doesn't bother me if I'm listening or watching a show that has profanities in it. But I should have the right to not want to use them. Now, have I ever used a profanity on a show? Probably. At some point, you know, I've you know used the S word. I don't know if I've dropped any F bombs. Probably not. But it's a word that I've used in my life. But we talk about the sensitizing of words. And sometimes you think of the, the sensitizing of words that are more hurtful than what we consider the F-bomb now. And, you know, I remember a skit or a comedy performance, I guess, at a club years ago by Lenny Bruce. And Lenny Bruce was recorded during this, this concert. And I think it was part of, a, part of a movie that was made about his life. And his point was to try to desensitize the N-word. And you think about it, that word has no use for the English language whatsoever. Whether you're black, you're white, or not, it doesn't matter what you are, who you are, it's just a word that you shouldn't say. There's, a, there's no constructivity in using that word. And we've established that as a society. But Lenny Bruce's thought is, hey, if it's desensitized, if it's said enough, maybe the word isn't as hurtful or taken in the context that we take it as it is now. And the reason I say that is not to go in that direction, 
but to kind of speak a little bit of where we've gone with what we call the F-bomb or the F-word. In fact, the F-word is not even what we used to think it was. It's a term, you know, you think of a term that's used derogatory when it comes to homosexuals. And that's become the new F-word. So the other F-word, which you don't have to go very far to hear people say it without any real, um, you know, issue with it, is being desensitized as we speak. And you wonder if that is going to be the way that things are going forward. Like I said, FCC does, the FCC doesn't regulate internet radio or Sirius XM. Cable TV can play as many curse words as it wants. It doesn't have to adhere to anything equivalent to the FCC. So you look at a word that was, I think I grew up knowing that it was a word that I shouldn't say, is becoming more acceptable to say. A little bit of a recap of the Passball Show, and as always, thank you for tuning in. Passball Show is brought to you by JohnPLA.com, by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. You know, the Lou Brock story, great ball player, and of course, you know, he's going to be missed. Great ambassador to the game, known as one of the nicer guys as it comes to the history of baseball, but was tough, was tough between the lines as it came to a, a being a competitor and a teammate and a leader. It's always going to be known for being on the right side of the worst trade or one of the worst trades made in baseball history. But a lot of us haven't heard the story or talked about the reason that he was traded. And unfortunately, there was race that was involved in it. Season ticket holders complaining to the owner of the Cubs, Philip Wrigley saying there's too many black players on the Chicago Cubs. I'm not going to renew my season tickets. And it's sad that something like that has to come out, but the fact that it did happen is something that a lot of us should understand. And as we hit the year of 2020, and we could talk about how far we've come, which I believe we have come a long way, Black Lives Matter, like I said, is not just all black people for black people. White liberals are on board. Entire generations of young white people. And white people that have just had enough of the hatred and vitriol that exists for people that are racist are all in support of black people in their lives. And the fact that we should be unified. And it's just sad to see that part of the reason of the Lou Brock trade had to do with race. Hiram Bithorn, not Roberto Clemente, was the first Puerto Rican player to play in Major League Baseball history. He's got a stadium named after him. But as we talk about the impact of Roberto Clemente, I think it's important to remember why he is remembered. First of all, the way he died, it was unfortunate. A terrible, tragic accident on a plane as he was delivering supplies to Nicaragua who had just had an earthquake wanted to deliver the supplies by himself. Baseball Hall of Famer, an absolute great player. If Roberto Clemente wasn't so good, maybe people would be looking at the likes of Hiram Bithorn for the impact that he had on Major League Baseball. First Puerto Rican born player, first fluent Spanish speaking player to ever play in Major League Baseball history. And you think of Jackie Robinson and how great he was. If Jackie Robinson wasn't so great, you know, maybe he was, I don't know, you know, a Joe Black or a Dan Bankhead. And there's a series of other black players that ended up playing in the major leagues that just weren't to the level of what you consider the stars. And if Jackie Robinson wasn't a star, may not have blazed the trail for all the other black players that ended up having great impacts on the history of Major League Baseball. So my point about Roberto Clemente, he said, retire 21 throughout baseball. While I wouldn't have a problem with it, I don't know if it's necessarily giving Hiram Bithorn the credit that he deserves for blazing the trail that he blazed 
for Puerto Rican and Spanish-born players to play in Major League Baseball. Once again, you want to hit up JohnPielli.com. We got links to the ba basketball reference profiles of every basketball team in the NBA's first coach in the history of the sport up on JohnPielli.com. You got baseball, football, if you wanted to look at some of them and realize that there are 11 Major League Baseball teams that have never hired a black manager, and there's nine NFL teams that have not hired a black coach. Got the top 100 offensive position players of all time, Major League Baseball history. Um, we're expanding the list. The, the list is well over 300 now, probably around 350 in regards to players that have profiled. So as we push towards getting a book and hopefully doing some appearances on some shows to talk about it, you know, some exciting things going on in the world of a past ball show on JohnPLA.com. As always, I do want to thank everybody for tuning in. We'll be back with you next week. This is the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com, by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey, by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck, located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We'll be back with you next week. God bless you, and as always, I'll see you on the other side.